Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Roz Curry, and I'd like to welcome you to the Civil Forfeiture Grant webinar. Uh, we're going to be um, with you for about an hour and a half, and we want to provide you with information about how to apply for a Civil Forfeiture Grant uh, with the Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General. So welcome. I'm, uh, I'm glad you're able to, uh, to join us today. Uh, just wanted to remind folks that our webinar is going to be recorded and posted on our uh, grants webpage, and uh, that will be available for anyone who um, wasn't able to join us today. Uh, so if you know of any anyone who would like to get this information, uh, you can point them to our web website. We're going to be um, going to lecture mode uh, now, so. Um, uh, we'll be uh, giving you the presentation, and then we're going to be opening up the phone lines uh, for for questions at the end. So, and you can also type a question into the uh, into the um, link chat box here. I'm not sure if that's the proper technical term, but uh, but I think some of you are uh, are on there already, and we're seeing questions. We will be answering your questions at the end of the presentation. Conference is in lecture mode. Okay, so welcome uh, again. My name is Roz Curry. I'm the uh, director of the Office to Combat Trafficking in Persons, and I'm also the director here at the branch that oversees the uh, the grants program. And I'm joined by uh, three of my colleagues today, and I will uh, let them each introduce themselves to you. Hello everyone, my name is Mark Williams and I'm a Program Performance Analyst here at the Victim Services and Crime Prevention Division. Uh, good morning everybody, my name is Claire Wheelan Siddiqui, I'm a Program Manager here in the Community Programs Branch and I manage uh, Victim Service and Violence Against Women programs um, in the North Central Region. And my name is Steve Lauer, I'm a Coordinator of Stakeholder Relations here at the Branch and I'm assisting. Now, we just had a request to turn up the volume, um, and I think hopefully people are, are hearing us okay, but please let us know uh, if the sound is still um, problematic, and we'll try to work on it from our, our end, and we'll also try to speak up. <laughs> I just want to emphasize uh, before we get going that the, um, the grants program is uh, focused on um, the reduction of crime and uh, the remediation of the impacts of crime on victims and communities. Uh, and that's um, what we will be talking to you about in some more detail today. The agenda we have uh, for our presentation is um, is on the slide. I'm on uh, slide four now, three, uh, four. I'm on slide four for those of you on the, um, the conference call following along. So the agenda for today is, uh, first of all, we'd like to provide an overview of the Crime Prevention and Remediation Grants Program and the Civil Forfeiture Office. <laughs> Secondly, we'll be looking at the specific funding streams we're offering this year in 2016-17. We'll be looking at the uh, detailed um, applications, so we will be taking you through each of the, um, the funding streams and pointing out some important information about the, uh, the applications. We'll also be looking at uh, helpful tips for you as applicants how funding decisions are made, the timelines for the grant process, our feedback process if you're not successful, and then we'll be opening it up for any questions. I'm on slide five now. So the Crime Prevention and Remediation Grants um, program is a uh, program of the um, Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General, the Civil Forfeiture Act and Regulation allows the Director of Civil Forfeiture to initiate civil court proceedings against property believed to be the instruments or proceeds of unlawful activity. The Civil Forfeiture Office is self-funding and forfeited funds which are recovered 
in excess of the budget can be used to compensate victims and support local crime prevention, crime reduction, and remediation efforts. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Let's go forward here. All right, I'm on slide six. So the minister, the ministry administers a crime prevention and crime remediation grant program, which provides one-time funds through proceeds from civil forfeiture. And so basically from year to year, we have priority areas for the grants that are made available through civil forfeiture, established uh, through the consideration of the government's current strategic initiatives, crime trends, and consultation with stakeholders. And so an example of some of these consultations is with the crime reduction initiatives, um, there are projects that are designed to identify, contain, and reduce an existing crime prevention problem in the community. And this priority aligns with the recommendations from the Blue Ribbon Panel on Crime Reduction and the Provincial Guns and Gangs Strategy. So another thing about the, the grants is that the value of, of the grants fluctuates year to year based on a variety of factors. However, the availability of the grant funding is typically announced in the late fall or early winter. And as well, to date, the office, uh, the um, Civil Forfeiture Office, has distributed over uh, two point, uh, sorry, $26.1 million in crime prevention grants and victim compensation payments. Okay, thank you, Steve. So that was a very brief overview of the uh, Civil Forfeiture Office that provides us with all this uh, fantastic grant money that we're able to provide to the community. Next, I, uh, I'm on slide seven, and I want to just review our funding streams this year. So you will see six different um, funding streams on the slide, and we're going to be going through in detail each one of these. Uh, in a few moments, but just in terms of an overview, um, as Steve mentioned, this year's funding streams do reflect government pr priorities to support objectives in the Blue Ribbon Panel on Crime Reduction, the Provincial Guns and Gang Strategy, and that's in our Crime Reduction stream there, the Violence Free BC Strategy, and we have three uh, different streams of funding that support this particular priority and uh, restorative justice processes, as well as indigenous healing and rebuilding. So those are our particular categories of funding this year, and we have an application for each stream available on our grants webpage. So uh, we have uh, the application forms. We have six different streams, and uh, uh, in in all of those streams, we have some common uh, sections in, uh, which we're asking people to fill out uh, for those um, uh, for for those proposals. And um, those common sections include uh, demonstrating the level of need for the project, um, identifying. Uh, the results of the project and milestones, and as well um, a budgeting and accounting. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, for most of the streams, we uh, include a section um, to identify uh, community stakeholders in the project, so to identify project partners um, or people who are submitting letters of support to the project. Uh, so the level of need can be uh, identified in a few ways. Uh, one is to is would be uh, community statistics, or um, uh, if there are community reports or surveys, um, information from those reports or surveys um, which speak to the level of need in the community. Uh, as well, it could involve um, uh, more um, anecdotal evidence. So so. Uh, um, if leaders in the community have identified a particular issue um, or that issue has been identified at, at a community planning table, um, that kind of information would also uh, be helpful to us. Uh, in the results and milestones section, uh, we're looking for people to identify what they see as the, the results of the project are going to be. And, um, and uh, So that could be that could be um, 
uh, specific deliverables, so producing a report or having a training session or um, or completing a, a, a series of workshops for for participants in the project. Uh, and as well, we're asking to uh, people to identify how they're going to measure that that progress. So so we're hoping that um, projects can put some thought into um, how they're going to measure those results. And and um, uh, yeah, so so each of these sections, it's very important to to make sure you fill these out. Um, another section is the budget and accounting section, and we have a, a basic budget template. Uh, which we ask people to fill out, which um, uh, requests some, some itemized um, expenditures for the project. Uh, and as well, one of the things we look for there is sort of value for money. So we're looking to see whether the budget aligns with, um, with the, the scope of the, of the project and, uh, and whether it seems like a reasonable amount uh, for what the project intends to achieve. Uh, and as well for most streams, as I mentioned, uh, identifying community stakeholders uh, um, will be important as well. Uh, identifying your partners, um, identifying uh, maybe uh, in some, uh, for some streams we, we um, are asking for letters of support as well. And so, uh, so to uh, basic the the basic point is that people need to uh, look at each of those sections, uh, try to fill it out to, your, to the best of your ability, and, and um, uh, for each application form, it's pretty clear what, uh, uh, what needs to be filled out. So. Great. Okay, we've moved to slide nine now, and, uh, and for the next few slides, we're going to be giving you some detailed information about each of the grant streams. So what Mark provided was a bit of an overview that we look for in most of the uh, streams and the applications you're going to be filling out. And now we'll be taking you through each of the six different grant streams that we have and giving you a little bit more information. So our first one is the uh, Crime Reduction Grants. So the uh, Crime Reduction Grant stream uh, these are one-time grants of funding up to $35,000, and they're available to fund crime reduction initiatives in British Columbia. Uh, this, um, this stream uh, is specifically focusing on uh, identifying or uh, containing or reducing or otherwise addressing a, uh, a known crime problem in the community. And uh, within the application form, we have a list of the types of projects which would be eligible for funding. And uh, they include an increased capacity to identify uh, priority crime issues in the community, to uh, projects to manage prolific and priority offenders more effectively, projects that focus on mental health and addictions issues and their intersection with crime, uh, projects that address illegal guns and gang activity, uh, projects that focus on, focus on youth at high risk of involvement in crime, and projects that strengthen interagency collaboration. And so I just wanted to uh, say a couple more words about a couple, of, uh, a couple of those points. One is that the um, projects that focus on youth at high risk of involvement in crime this is a, a little bit more restricted category than um, grant streams in the past, which have been open to general youth crime prevention projects. And so what we're looking for in the, in the proposals is um, some evidence that the project is uh, targeting those, those youth that um, have uh, that are at high risk of involvement in crime. So general youth crime prevention projects uh, may not be eligible for this stream um, if, if the scope of the project is to uh, speak to youth more generally um, 
you know, with the usual at, uh, risk and protective factors. Um, I also want to speak to the last, um, the last type of project, uh, which is to strengthen interagency collaboration and information sharing to address existing crime issues in a community. And um, there's sort of a spectrum of things which might fit in there. Uh, that it could be anything from um, a community crime reduction, uh, a crime reduction planning committee. It could be um, uh, another thing would be um, teams that uh, get together to information share around um, addressing the needs um, or issues uh, raised by prolific offenders in the community. And as well, uh, this stream would also include um, ICATs, or Integrated Case Assessment Teams. And we have a number of the um, ICATs around the province, uh, which are uh, primate, which are those information sharing teams set up to address um, issue, um, issues of um, high-risk domestic violence. Great. Okay. Thanks, Mark. The next uh, stream, and I'm on uh, slide 10 now, that we'd like to address is the um, violence-free BC, sexual violence, human trafficking, sexual exploitation, and vulnerable women in the sex trade. So here we have grant funding of up to $30,000 per project available. And we're looking for uh, projects that implement the priorities of and best practices identified in the violence-free BC strategy in these three, three or four specific areas, so sexual violence, human trafficking, slash sexual exploitation, and vulnerable women in the sex trade. And the violence-free BC strategy is a 10-year strategy that the um, British Columbia government initiated a couple of years ago. And uh, this is something that uh, we want to support is, is projects that would really promote um, the uh, implementation of this strategy. And you will see a, a link for more information uh, to um, things like the Violence Free BC strategy. You'll see a link in the uh, application form to that if you want some more information. And also in the crime reduction stream that Mark mentioned, you'll see links uh, in that application form to the, um, the crime reduction, uh, getting serious about crime reduction report of the Blue Ribbon Panel on crime reduction, as well as the, um, the provincial guns and gangs strategy, just to give you a bit more information about uh, the focus of, of those particular uh, streams. So getting back to this one, um, the, uh, the mandatory criteria is um, set out on the slide. Projects must clearly focus on at least one of the following priorities. So we're looking for projects that address sexual violence. Uh, last year we supported some projects on uh, university and college campuses, uh, helping those um, institutions to develop policies to address uh, sexual violence and sexual assault. And uh, this year, uh, we're looking at um, hopefully continuing some of that work as well as other community-based initiatives to address sexual violence. As well, we're looking at um, projects that will focus on human trafficking or sexual exploitation of youth. And uh, this can be um, a variety of things, again, uh, really looking to you to um, identify the, the need for this kind of project in your community and, uh, and describing the project uh, for us. Vulnerable women in the sex trade as well is a priority, and uh, we want to uh, encourage you to clearly set out how your project supports uh, some of the um, information that uh, is included in that vision for a violence-free BC strategy. Um, so we're now on slide number 11, um, and this is one of the grant streams which is about enhancing domestic violence units. Um, I think it's, it's key this, that this stream is really for only four existing DVUs, and there are nine of those um, in the province. They're located in Abbotsford, uh, Victoria, Greater Victoria, Kelowna, Nanaimo, New Westminster, Surrey, 
Vancouver, Prince George, and North Vancouver. And the focus of this stream this year is to enhance those um, those current, those existing domestic violence units. So just it's key to understand it's enhancing existing, and it's not for um, any new any new uh, domestic violence uh, units. Um, so I think. A, the, the, the grant funding for this year for these projects is up to 70000 but we'd certainly encourage um, people to apply for um, any smaller initiatives or projects that could be completed for less than 70000 as well. Um, it's, not, there's not, it's not necessary to go all the way up to 70000 but we do, so we strongly encourage people to look at uh, um, those types of projects. And, and just for your knowledge, a domestic violence unit what those are, um, they're usually a co-located collaborative model between police, um, a community-based victim service um, that would respond to the highest risk domestic violence cases in that particular community. And then also some domestic violence units also actually include um, a child protection worker. There's a couple across the province that do that. So uh, it's really that collaborative model, co-located model. So um, again, yeah, so this, this, this streaming is really looking at enhancing those units, and it's limited for only those, those units that are already existing. So also within the violence-free BC uh, strategy on slide 12, um, we, are also, we also have a stream uh, to fund child and youth advocacy centers. Again, this stream is uh, limited to, uh, a, to existing child and youth advocacy centers or those that are in development. And the projects that are eligible to apply are listed in the application. And uh, the proposals could... Um, we are looking at uh, develop, you know, developing standards within those child and youth advocacy centers. So projects that that are um, that propose a project uh, to uh, develop standards uh, would be considered, as well as um, we would also consider um, funding some oper some operational expend uh, expenses for those um, child and youth advocacy centers in development. And uh, just to um, let everyone know, um, those centers uh, provide a coordinated approach to support uh, children and youth uh, through the uh, criminal justice system, which can be very traumatic for children. So it's sort of a child-friendly setting where, um, where children and youth are supported to, um, through that process. So we're moving on to the next slide, which is number 13, and this stream is um, the Indigenous Healing and Rebuilding Grant, um, and this was offered uh, last year as well. Um, it's very specific, this stream, for um, Indigenous communities, individuals, or families. Um, so the focus of this, this uh, grant is to provide um, support for projects that use holistic approaches. Um, and I think it would, it's important to understand what holistic is. It, it's really basically looking at projects that are focusing on emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual aspects of healing um, and rebuilding um, within an impacted community, and also um, including culturally identified practices that contribute to healing. So, I mean, some examples of that in the past have been like the healing camps that have happened and uh, various projects that might use land-based methodology, etc. There's a really great resource if you're interested in knowing a little bit more about some of the projects that have been funded in the past. Um, if you go to the grants page, um, there is a link there for the Healing and Rebuilding Bulletin. Um, and it really is a great resource to look at some of the work that has taken place in the past, to look at some of the initiatives that some of the that the communities have have undertaken. Um, again, I think it's really important to um, emphasize that this really is about Indigenous communities, and we are looking for that Indigenous community um, to be at the center of this. So uh, we really uh, are looking at proposals that are really demonstrating that that linkage um, to those um, to those communities and that, and that they have had a role in, in the creation of this of those projects. Um, yeah, so and then we'll move on to the next slide, which is slide 14. And this uh, stream is regarding the Serving Victims to Restorative Justice 
um, building program accountability. So this year, um, on the, under this stream, we have um, one-time grant funding of up to $7,500 for a community project and up to $35,000 for a provincial project. And these are available to support projects that really focus on building program accountability within restorative justice programs. Now, it is important to note that, the only, that you have to be a CAP, a current uh, CAP funded program, and that's Community Accountability Program, and um, those who are CAP programs will know who they are. So it, it is limited to that, or so that would be for the individual community, you have to be a, um, through a Community Accountability Program, or that um, the, for the provincial project that includes a collaboration that does involve community accountability programs. So really, those are really at the center of um, this year's funding. Um, so the proposals this year, they must really focus on building program accountability within restorative justice. And that could include projects that develop and implement um, best practices or standards or protocols. Um, and there is, um, the, on that um, application, there is also uh, a link to the rec There was a document that was created uh, recently from the community on recommended principles and standards for restorative justice providers in criminal matters. Um, it's a document, I think, that could um, potentially inform some of the projects as they move forward. Um, so I think that's a, a really good resource if you're interested. And I think it's also really important to note, too, that um, for account community accountability programs, as is consistent with our policy um, in the uh, in current policy, the proposals cannot address issues related to any power-based crimes. And so examples of power-based is usually if there is violence against women in relationships or sexual assault, hate-motivated crimes or um, abuse situations. These are all power-based crimes, and they are not eligible for um, any work under the, the CAP program, so we just wanted to remind you of that. Great. Thank you, Claire. Uh, we're going to move on to slide 15 now, and I, I see um, some questions already popping up, which is great, and we will get uh, get to those questions uh, at the end of the PowerPoint. So we just have a few more slides uh, to go through with you, and then we'll turn over to the questions. So our slide 15, tips for applicants. Uh, please read each application form carefully before submitting a proposal. As you've heard, each stream has unique criteria. Please try to choose the one that best fits your project. And sometimes your project might fit into um, you know, a couple of different streams. So please read through those, uh, those mandatory criteria and just make sure that uh, you've, you've got the right stream. You're, you're looking at the right application form. And make sure your organization is also eligible to apply. So uh, in particular, the um, domestic violence unit stream, the uh, child and youth advocacy stream, and the restorative justice stream have a, um, a restricted uh, group of, of organizations that, that can apply, as we've mentioned. So the funding limits for the grants vary in each stream, as you've heard. So uh, please make sure your budget lines up with the maximum amount that we can provide uh, to you for that, that stream. And uh, if, if your uh, application, if that stream requires um, evidence of partnership and collaboration, please submit uh, your required letters or emails of support at the same time as your completed application. This is really important because we get so many applications, uh, we really can't accept letters of support that come in um, at a different time than your application. It's just too difficult to try to make sure that everything is kind of all matched up. So if you could um, start to work on that part of your application very quickly, to, um, to gather your uh, letters of support and include them at the same time as your completed application. And really important is that we have uh, stream contacts, and they actually happen to be Mark and Claire, who are with me today. Uh, and they're identified in each of the application forms. And they are the, uh, the folks that you can call if you've got a, a specific project idea that you'd like to run by them or you have any further questions about 
uh, the information we provided today. So um, please take advantage of, uh, of Mark and Claire's uh, time, and, uh, and please uh, call them or email them with uh, any questions that you have. And their contact information is included in each of the application forms. So on last slide 16, just a couple of other tips uh, for you as applicants. Um, if, please cover all of the points that are listed in the application. And sometimes uh, subheadings can help to organize your application. Um, and one of the, um, the uh, sets of subheadings we've included here on this slide uh, so if you could um, use subheadings like outline of the project and then give, just give us a brief outline of what your project is trying to do. Another subheadings would be issues and then just describe what are the issues that your project is trying to address. Uh, again, um, another subheading uh, audience or who your project's trying to serve uh, and, and describe that for us. Uh, and just kind of going down project ob objectives and goals what will the project do and how will the project be implemented? So we ask you to kind of describe that on, uh, in one page uh, at the beginning of your application form. Also be concrete and specific and just, you know, avoid jargon and, uh, and we're really looking for, you know, just simple, basic, concrete, specific information about what your project is trying to do, how you think it will meet the need, that you've identified in the community and, and describe the activities that, that you want to undertake. Please sign the last page of the application. That's really important. And if uh, you could send your application to the CFO grants um, mailbox. And that's a little bit of a different uh, email box from last year. And, uh, and it's specifically for your application forms. And once you send that in, you'll be receiving an automatic uh, reply that we received your, uh, your grant application. Um, so we're on slide 17. And this is just to kind of recap how our decisions are made. So we do have a formal process that we undergo. Um, so there are separate review teams um, for each of the categories. And applications received under those categories are individually are first individually evaluated by each of the members of the team and scored against the criteria. Then the um, so the applications are screened first for eligibility. So one of the first things that the, the, the individuals will when 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 going through the process will ensure, for instance, if you need to be a a, a DVU for the, the application, they will check if you're a DVU, and then if you don't meet that eligible criteria, you're not a DVU, then your application um, probably won't be scored because you haven't met that first eligibility. So, and they just want to make sure that the projects fit the stream. So there's first an assessment of that. And so once then, after the individuals that have gone through each of the, the, the applications have um, screened for eligibility and done an individual score, the review team will then meet and then they will discuss all of the applications and assign a consensus um, score. So when then at the end of all of the applications have been scored by the entire team and a consensus has been reached on each of the application, then the decisions are, are um, first based on highest scoring applications. Um, and then one of the, um, it's important to note that we also take into consider some of the, into consideration some of the geographic distribution um, in making a final determination uh, because one of the purposes is to ensure um, that the grants are, um, that there's, all, there's accessibility for everybody. So we really do also take into consideration where projects might be um, in conjunction with the scoring that they have received. So that's one of the elements that are considered during our, our decision-making process. Great. Okay, so we've just got a couple more slides uh, left here. Um, in terms of our timelines, we have posted the, the grant applications on our grants webpage, and there's a link there for folks that uh, have the PowerPoint. 
Um, so those were posted on November 7th. The applications are due on December 16th at 4.30, and that's specific standard time. Um, the um, notification for all of our um, successful and actually unsuccessful applicants will um, be around the same time, around March 31st, uh, 2017. And then um, in April, our staff are available to provide feedback to the unsuccessful applicants. And the successful applicants will be uh, receiving a check uh, for the full amount of the grant uh, in, in usually in April uh, at some point. Uh, we can't um, absolutely guarantee when that happens, but it's, uh, it's usually very quickly after March 31st. And just to note that we're looking for projects that are one-time um, funding. We cannot provide ongoing funding. So we're looking for uh, projects that ideally are um, one year in dur duration. So they would uh, begin on April 1st, 2017, and conclude on March 31st, 2018. We really... Um, Encourage you to wait until the um, the information is provided to you on uh, or around March 31st, 2017. We just simply uh, won't be in a position to give you any information any earlier than that. So um, so please hang on till till that uh, that end date. In terms of our feedback process, um, the unsuccessful applicants are given an opportunity to speak with our review team members. And those review team members are um, our staff of our, our uh, branch. And we can provide you information about why your application was not successful and discuss ways to strengthen your future applications. Because we do want uh, as many of you to be uh, successful as possible and receive a grant. The um, branch contact person and contact information will be provided by uh, March 31st, 2017 to you, and then uh, you can set up a time to, to get that, um, that debrief session set up. And as I mentioned this year, you will receive an automatic confirmation after you submit your application to us, and um, that will just be an email that we've received your, uh, your application so that you know it got through the, uh, the email system. So that's the end of our formal presentation. Uh, we have um, uh, a good chunk of time for questions, it looks like. And we do have a, uh, a number of questions in the, um, in the chat box here. And we're also going to open up the phone lines for, uh, for questions as well. So I'm going to take the questions as they came in order on our chat box, and then we'll go to the uh, questions on the conference call. So the first question is from Sharon. Um, can you apply for a grant for the same project in order to continue providing that service or to build it? Yes, you, you can apply uh, year over year to us, Sharon, but just make sure that the project fits with our current streams that we've, um, we've listed. The, the streams do change uh, every year, and we tried to give you um, a fair bit of detail today about what we're looking for in each of those streams. So a project that we funded last year may not fit as well into uh, the current funding stream. So just make sure you have a close look at the, um, at the application form and the mandatory criteria. OK, we're going to go to the next question. And that's from Shannon. Uh, and Shannon asks, could the Child and Youth Advocacy Center's funding be accessed by an Aboriginal delegated child and youth agency doing the work, yet uh, not designated an advocacy center? So Shannon, um, the, the funding that we are providing is to support um, existing and designating, designated child and youth advocacy centers this year. Uh, but we'd certainly be interested to um, learn more about your uh, particular 
agency and the work that you're doing. So uh, perhaps you could um, send an email to our uh, crime prevention inbox that was listed on the grants page with um, a little bit more information, and we'd be happy to follow up with you because our, our branch is, um, is uh, very interested in, in what else is kind of going on out there and, uh, and looking at uh, some of the, um, the services that you provide. So encourage you to, uh, to follow up with us. And uh, next I'll go to a question from Sharon. And Sharon asks, where is the paper again mentioned in Stream 6, Re-Victim Accountability, that we can use as a resource? It was mentioned, but very quickly. Oh, yeah. And um, Sharon, I have that. So the, the title of the document is called Recommended Principles and Standards for Restorative Justice Providers in Criminal Matters. And if you go to the application online on the, uh, under the Restorative Justice Program Accountability, there's actually a link to that document in the application. So, um, so you should be able to find it there. If you have any problems finding it or accessing that link, um, there's contact information um, for myself and or Mark. And if uh, you're having any problems accessing that link or getting to that document, you can give us a call and we can, um, we can assist you with that. Great. Okay. Thanks very much, Claire. Uh, now we've got a question, quite a long question, from uh, Corporal uh, Dave Gustin. And uh, Dave, you wanted to get some more information about the uh, at-risk youth. Uh, I'm not going to read out your entire question because it is quite long. Um, but instead, I'm just going to turn um, the, uh, the response over to Mark, who's, uh, who's going to just give you a little bit more of a definition of what we're looking for. Uh, I think some of the things you mentioned in your um, in your question are are definitely indicators, uh, but we do want to make sure that the um, the community is the one that's identifying uh, a specific group of youth that are uh, at high risk of involvement in um, in crime. So over to Mark. So yeah, so the. Um so we, we have limited it this year. Uh, some of the kinds of projects that we funded in the past have been uh, general awareness programs for school-aged youth, for example. And, um, and uh, we have a more limited sort of vision for what we will be able to fund uh, this year in terms of um, high-risk youth uh, for involvement of crime. And some of those things um, you do mention in your question, uh, you students that um, are involved in crime, um, using uh, using drugs, um, uh, and uh, and so we don't really have a comprehensive definition of uh, uh, um, youth at high risk of involvement in crime. We wanted to limit it, but also not make it so restrictive that we wouldn't consider um, other um, projects that might be defined in a way that, you know, we're not really uh, aware of, you know, that are coming from the community. But those kind of, but for youth who are currently involved in crime, certainly, um, who are um, uh, youth being referred from the police, for example, or schools who um, are identifying um, youth uh, at risk of crime who have been suspended or chronically through it and have a very weak attachment to school. For example, um, youth with uh, known mental health or addictions issues. Uh, and we would also consider, you know, um, projects which where the youth are referred by family members, health providers, or other community organizations, um, you know, as long as those uh, youth um, are identified at, at high risk. And um, so, so we're aware that it's not a, a perfectly satisfactory uh, definition, but at the same time, um, we, um, we hope that people understand that it's, um, that, uh, that we are looking for those higher risk youth and not sort of general crime prevention projects. 
Great, and I just want to add that the um, the projects um, we're looking for really need to specifically tell us how you are identifying and working with a group of youth. So we, we want, again, those um, projects that are really targeting a group of youth that have been identified as, as being at high risk of involvement in crime. And certainly um, kids that are already involved in uh, the, the criminal justice system would, would certainly uh, qualify for this, this particular stream. And if you have more questions, please uh, give Mark or, or Claire a call. I'm going to move uh, along with the uh, rest of the questions here, and then we want to open it up to the phone line. So, um, Nathan, are organizations able to apply in multiple streams, i.e. not the same project, but multiple projects? Yes, the answer is yes. You may um, apply to uh, multiple streams. Um, but just make sure, again, that you are providing um, a project that really meets the, the criteria. We do score the projects that are um, against the criteria in the application form, so we're looking for the strongest projects in each stream. So um, you're definitely welcome to apply to additional streams, but just make sure your project fits, uh, fits well with the stream criteria. And Pat asks, is community restricted to geographical location, or could something like people with disabilities be considered a community? Um, hi, Pat. I think the um, it depends on what stream you're looking at. Generally, um, community is, is considered either a geographical community or um, a cultural community. Um, so certainly, you know, we, we, we could have a look at an application like that. I, I actually would encourage you to talk to Mark and, and Claire about this. This is a, a little bit of a different issue that I don't think we've really um, addressed before. So please give uh, Mark or Claire a call and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you, get a bit more information about uh, what you're thinking of in terms of a project there. Uh, thank you for your time and, and helpful insight. Thank you very much, Ula. Uh, Wayne asks, are organizations able to apply for grants under the same category but from several different institutions, essentially several applications from the same organization for the same category? Uh, so, Wayne, we're, we're looking for, um, you know, strong projects in each of these streams. Uh, you can apply for multiple streams. Um, I think you're asking under the same category but from several different institutions. Uh, I guess it depends if there's, if there's a project that a number of institutions are coming together uh, to collaborate on, then that would be one project we're looking for. Um, so I'm not quite sure if I'm understanding your, your question here. Uh, several applications from the same organization for the same category. Uh, really, it should be, you know, the organization that's taking <clears throat> the lead on the project should be the one that's um, submitting the application, and then others could be, could be um, providing letters of support, perhaps, or be considered uh, a partner. Uh, but we could certainly entertain an application from a number of uh, organizations. Again, I'm not quite sure if I'm understanding fully the question there, so please feel free to, to uh, call back in. Uh, is there an ideal number of community letters of support you would like to see? Um, not really, Leslie. We're, you know, we're just looking to you to demonstrate that you have, um, you know, community support. So usually, you know, uh, a couple of letters, two or three letters is, is um, you know, is usually sufficient. It depends, you know, which um, organizations you're partnering with, of course. Some may be larger, um, you know, larger community organizations or provincial organizations, something like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, two or three uh, letters of support is, is definitely sufficient. Okay, so Alicia has a question about budget. Um, are salaries that are directly connected to program and eligible program expense? Yes, they are. So if, you, uh, if your project requires a project coordinator for the one-year period of time, um, 
that's definitely something we would consider uh, funding. And your question is also, are we able to apply for an existing program that has been very successful in crime prevention in order to continue it? Uh, and yes, again, you can. You do need to have a look at that crime reduction stream, Alicia, because the um, criteria has changed and we're not able to this year um, support general crime prevention projects as we have uh, more in the past. So again, please really have a look at the uh, application forms and give us a call if you want to speak to us about the uh, specifics of your of your project, but if, if as long as you're uh, we're, you're looking at a project that would support activities for about one year, um, then you know if it's an ongoing pr project and it's uh, successful, then uh, then that's definitely something we could look at. But again, have a look close look at those application forms. Michelle's asking about delegated accredited Aboriginal agencies applying for the Indigenous Healing and Rebuilding. Uh, Yes, so you're looking at uh, First Nations communities in um, Prince George. And I would say that, yes, um, for the healing and rebuilding grants, we're looking at, um, at Aboriginal organizations, First Nations, uh, com could be First Nations community members applying uh, to conduct a project that would focus on healing and rebuilding from crime. Uh, violence, victimization, or trauma uh, experienced by uh, Aboriginal First Nations uh, communities. So, yes, I would say that um, you would definitely, uh, we would definitely be looking uh, at an application from you in that particular stream. The Indigenous Healing and Rebuilding stream is really for those community projects that are focused on healing and rebuilding. Yeah, and Claire just wants to add something as well. I think, too, one of the things I um, maybe just forgot to add for that stream, which um, is that their focus is on um, trauma and that trauma uh, victimization of crime, which can be um, included of intergenerational trauma or um, lateral violence. I think those are a number of um, pot uh, potential um, focuses of the project. So um, while there is, a pr there is that preferred criteria, um, for projects um, uh, that they focus on uh, violence against women and indigenous, indigenous women and girls, um, it's not necessary that they do. So I just wanted to um, kind of illustrate that this year, because I think last year the projects um, had to focus on uh, violence against indigenous women and girls, but this year it's not. Um, that's not the only focus this year. So I just wanted to flag that for people. Great. Okay. Thanks, Claire. The Delta Police has a DVU section but was not on your list. How is DVU defined under this process? So there is a um, specific definition that we use of, um, of domestic violence units, and it is that partnership between a community-based victim service worker and a um, police department. So. If you have a, um, a DVU section, then maybe you could, could call us back. And uh, the domestic violence units are a very specific partnership, though, where there is a, um, a funded uh, victim service worker who's from a community-based victim service program, and they're paired up and they work and co-located with a um, police officer. So that's the model that... Uh, it has been proven to be a best practice and that we are um, supporting this year. But you're, feel free to, um, to call us and, and we can explore that a little bit more with you. Can a nonprofit social enterprise apply on the grants? Uh, oh, sorry, can a for-profit social enterprise apply on the grants? Um, there's no absolute restriction against um, for-profit organizations applying for the grants. However, the focus of the civil forfeiture grants is on uh, community uh, crime prevention, crime reduction, and, um, and victim compensation. So we're really, um, you know, looking for community-based agencies to, to apply. So if you um, pair up with a community nonprofit organization or a school or 
uh, some other uh, community-based organization, then uh, that's that would be our preference. But there's no absolute restriction, and uh, it, it really depends on the um, the kind of social enterprise that you are, and the kind of the focus of your project, and who your partners are. All right, so uh, Vicky is um, asking a question. Can a single organization apply for more than one project within a single category? OK, yes, you can. Uh, however, I would just caution you that we get um, many, many, many applications for grant funding. It's very um, competitive. Our process is um, you know, it's quite a simple one, but we, we do get quite a few applications. So. Uh, we do look at geographic distribution at the end, I think as Claire mentioned, to make sure that we have distributed the grants around the province. Uh, and also we, we want to make sure that we're distributing the grants uh, fairly among organizations as well. So, um, so you're, you're not precluded from doing it. My advice to you would be to um, you know, look at one or two of your strongest projects and, and submit those. Uh, but you're certainly not precluded from, from sending in uh, multiple applications. Uh, we just uh, need to, you know, warn you that there are, there are other considerations that we make in our final determination. And we do want to make sure that as many strong projects from as many communities around BC uh, receive a grant. And then we have a question about if we're applying for crime reduction stream and the support is up to 35000 but our program budget is 65000 are we able to ask for a portion of the grant uh, if we have support for the remaining confirmed? Yes. Uh, in fact, there is a section in our budget template that asks for um, other funding sources that you might have secured for your, your project. So um, please give us those, those details uh, when, you're, when you're applying for your grant. And then from Edith, would a respectful relationship program qualify for funding? And Edith, I believe that's a, um, a type of program that's offered in the schools. And it, um, it uh, may not be, uh, it may not be um, supported uh, in the crime reduction stream this year or um, you know, you'd have to look at this, the uh, violence-free BC stream that would, um, would uh, will give you a bit more information about kind of what we're looking for there. But, but um, yeah, and, and maybe just give Mark and Claire a call so we can, we can think about that question a bit. Uh, I know general um, kind of, you know, programs and projects aimed at general awareness raising is not really uh, something that we're able to fund this year because of different priorities, um, but the respectful relationships may be uh, a project that we could look at in the violence-free BC stream. So, so please give us a call on that one, and we'll we'll uh, we'll get back to you with more information. I think Mark has a comment as well. Yeah, it it depends on the type of project. So, if it was in an Aboriginal community, for example, it might uh, fit uh, in the healing and rebuilding stream. In the crime reduction stream, if it's a uh, fourth R uh, project, those projects certainly are best practice, um, you know, for with um, with crime prevention outcomes. Uh, but it is a more general um, school-based program for um, youth generally, and um, wouldn't um, fit the crime reduction um, uh, criteria that we've laid out for this year. Um. Okay, I think we're going to go, I think we're going to open the phone lines now since we don't seem to have any other questions in our, uh, in our link chat. So uh, Steve's going to open up the phone line somehow here for us. Oops. Conference is no longer in lecture mode. There we go. Okay, so do we have any questions from the, uh, the phone? Any questions on the phone? Remember, if you're muted, you may have to unmute yourself. Hi, good afternoon. It's sure to unmute yourself before you try to ask a question, or you and you can continue to ch type in questions as well. 
Hello. Anything Can else? Any, anybody has a question about uh, any of the streams or mm. any of our process? Can you hear me? Hi, it's Pat Kell. Hi, Pat. Hi. Looking at you, were saying that um, awareness raising is really out of any of the funding streams this year. Um, I guess that would probably best for me to talk about it. Yeah. It's just confirmation that I think Pat, um, no, I'm glad you clarified that. In that, that um, Violence Free BC stream, if you have a project that uh, is focused on, uh, you know, raising awareness and addressing issues of sexual violence with respect to women with disabilities, then that is something we could look at. Uh, in the scope of that um, violence-free BC stream, that would certainly yeah, be the last stream I thought it perhaps applicable. Yes, absolutely. Because if you're looking at sexual violence, and obviously women with disabilities are a very vulnerable uh, and marginalized group, so we would uh, we would definitely be able to look at it. But in that particular stream, that uh, the violence-free BC stream that focuses on uh, projects related to sexual violence. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Question. I believe Shona has that question. Great. Oh, okay. Hi, Shona. <laughs> we can't see your question for some reason. I told her that they're going to have to be smaller. Many voices talking over each other. Oh, dear. I don't. I, I, have to I don't. I guess we're not hearing that. Um, okay. No. Okay. So I guess we're we're. Uh, I don't know. Sorry if there's a problem on the on the line. We're not hearing the uh, the talking over. Um, is there any more questions from the phone? Because we're we're really not hearing too many. <laughs> Can you hear me? It's, can somebody say something on the phone just so I make sure we're, we have f folks out there? <laughs> yeah, Corporal Foo's on here. Can you hear me? Hi, Dad. Oh, good. Okay, great. Is, is all this making sense? It's not COVID because you yeah, want to be safe. Okay. Yes. Definitely. Okay, super. Okay. All right, so uh, if we don't have any further questions. Um, I Okay, I think we have one more question online. Corporal, Corporal, did you have a question? Yes. What's your question? I just want to uh, talk a little more about this uh, crime reduction grant with the at-risk piece. Uh, maybe Mark and I should talk further, but uh, well, I, you know, we've got a bit of a small crisis going on in, in our communities here, and the drug itself um, is infiltrating into drugs that kids use, and uh, it's putting the kids at high risk. Uh, and uh, so the schools are coming to us saying, "Look, our kids are at high risk, get air for and they need uh, they need they need uh, training." So uh, just looking at putting together an initiative to help with that, and that's where I need your help. Thank you, thank you very much, Dave. So Dave just had a question about the high risk youth, um, and and it was further to the. Um, the conversation that, or the the message that he sent previously. So I would suggest that he follows up with either Mark or Claire. Um, the um, if you look in um, the application forms, their contact information is provided, and that would be the best place to to have the discussion uh, okay, because it sounds like you have some very specific questions that yeah. that we need to need to address. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, we still don't have Shona's question. Okay, not sure where Shona went. <laughs> All right, well, I guess we'll just close off um, the uh, webinar now, and please, um, you know, call in to Mark or Claire if you have any other specific questions. And thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Okay, thanks. Bye for now. Thank you.